Um, what we're going to do next is I'm going to invite up um, several of your leaders in the state who are going to participate in a conversation about how you're doing this in Indiana, and, and we're going to try to bring the audience into this conversation. Uh, as I said, anyone who's interested in learning more about what we're seeing across the country, I'd love to chat with you after, after the, the meeting and, and follow up. And we do have a Level Up website, which you can, re you can uh, Google and look up online, and it's up here on the screen if you want to learn more about these best practices. And frankly, if you have things that are going on in your community that we should know about, we'd like to hear about them, and we'd like to put them uh, up there for everyone to see. So without further ado, I'm going to invite my uh, fellow panelists uh, to come up uh, to have a conversation about this work in Indiana. Um, I'm really pleased that Commissioner Lovers is going to join me up here on stage, that P.J. McGrew, the Director of Policy for the Governor's Workforce Cabinet, is going to come up, and also uh, my friend Jason Bierce, the Vice President of Workforce and Education at the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. So welcome and come on up. And I'm going to transition over. <clears throat> All right. All our mics are on. And they weren't accidentally on earlier. I hope All not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so as I said, I uh, gave you a lot of the national perspective. Um, before we get into the specific work here in Indiana, I thought I'd ask each of you just to say a, a quick word about uh, your personal experience, whether it was transitioning from K-12 into higher education or perhaps from either into the workforce, um, and if you have any just reflections based on your experience about what, what, what worked and what didn't before we get into the, the specifics of the strategies and policies here in Indiana. Commissioner Lovers, you want to, you want to go first? Well, I will. And to personalize this for us? I'm <laughs> clearly much older than the rest of the folks <laughs> on the panel, so my experience might be a little different, but uh, I graduated from high school in 1969, and that period of time in the early 70s was a real a time of great transition, much like we're facing right now. The economy changing, the expectations for jobs changing. <clears throat> Um, I would say that college was not an expectation, but it was an expectation from my family. Uh, neither of my parents went to college, but uh, certainly I grew up thinking that I would, and I'm not exactly sure why. You know, I don't know why I thought college was for me when um, it may have not been for others who were at that same era. I think part of the reason may have been is that I had incredible teachers who invested in me in the K-12 sector. Uh, who encouraged me, who made me think of a world much bigger than the one that I might have. And I think that really informs how I feel about some of the work we do today. Because if you ask people what they want to do with their lives, they are very likely to be limited by the experiences of those around them. And so we really have an obligation, I think, to make sure that people understand a, a wide range of opportunities. It was a time of transition for women. Uh, who actually for, uh, were thinking about education beyond high school in a way they hadn't before. So I think that experience that I had uh, in high school certainly helped. And then I had, I'll just mention very briefly, throughout my career I've had incredible mentors uh, who have always, you know, encouraged me uh, without being political. I have had a, you know, nearly a 40-year relationship in terms of a mentor with uh, what former U.S. Senator Dick Lugar who start, I started with when I was 19 years old and has invested in me in every step of the way and encouraged me. So I think those high school teachers, mentors throughout lives made a difference in terms of my aspirations. Thank you. I want to come back to that and the question of how available such folks are to, to those who need it the most. PJ, how about you? What's your story? Uh, so, you know, my, some of you know this in the room. Um, my transition was a little bit different than Commissioner Lovers. I, too, was uh, the first person in my immediate family to go to college. Uh, you know, I, I excelled in high school, but when I got to college, I really struggled. Uh, I had never had to, you know, study before, really pick up a book, uh, didn't really know how to learn, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, I went to college because, you know, I knew that I needed to go to college in order to get a good job, but I wasn't sure what my path might be. So 
I ended up dropping out of college uh, in between my junior and senior year of college. Fortunately, I had invested quite well in the stock market, so I had some money saved up that allowed me to kind of figure out my path. Um, I started substitute teaching um, and decided that that's what I really was passionate about. So I went back to school, um, picked up uh, my degree, and began teaching. And it really took getting a job first in order for me to figure out what I wanted to do. Interesting story. All right. Thank you. Jason. Well, I can't compete with that. Um, but I, too, am a first-generation college student. And I think, like many first-gen students, my parents encouraged me and instilled in me from a very early age that I should go to college. But they weren't equipped, since they hadn't really been through the process themselves, to really know in a specific way how to help me navigate that. But you know, I went to college. Um, like PJ, although I didn't drop out or play the stock market, um, I did feel a little lost for part of that time. But it was really getting a, a, a series of internships when I was in college that put me on the path to the education policy arena, which, depending on the day, either feels like an inspira inspiring story or a cautionary tale. But for today, we'll say it's inspiring. So stick with you, Jason, just for a minute on the topic of the day of kind of strength and collaboration between two systems that uh, should be really well connected, but oftentimes are not. Just give me a quick sense of what what brings you to this conversation and, and you know, why, it, in your role at the chamber, really, why are you uh, involved and supportive of this? And I'm going to come back down the, the line here asking that same question. Then we're going to sink our teeth into the <coughs> policy to, issues. Just to clarify what you want me to, to, to hone in on, are you talking about the connection between uh, K-12 and post-secondary, or education and both, 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 um, from the chamber's perspective, representing. Yeah, the I mean, I think yeah. you know, at the risk of being critical, things have come a long way, but I think each of those sectors still operate in a more siloed way than we would like. Um, I think an example of that is right now there's a bill going through the legislature, and from the chamber, we're pushing pretty hard that the state's school accountability formula, at some level, look at what happens to our K-12 graduates after they leave that system. You know, um, have they earned a credential in addition to a high school diploma? Are they enrolling in post-secondary education without the need for mediation? Are they pursuing something like military service that's going to put them on a path to a debt-free credential? And that notion, even if it's a relatively small, small amount of you know, the overall school grade, letter grade, is, is still a fairly controversial notion. Um, I continue to believe that our high schools, just like our colleges, can do a lot to put students on a productive path. And there are a lot of missed opportunities when we look at graduation alone as the goal. Um, now I'll speak a little more critically of um, the sector I, that I advocate for right now. I think employers have always been engaged at some level with education, but I think a lot of it has been fairly surface level or ad hoc or even kind of transactional. And I think what we're on the verge of seeing now is a recognition by more and more of our employers that they can't just serve um, in the capacity of consuming talent. They have to have a stake in actually developing that talent, um, all the more so depending on how specialized and specific their needs are. And that's going to require not only deeper engagement, but much earlier engagement than I think they've been expected to do in the past. Thank you for saying that. I want, I'll come back to that in a few minutes as well. PJ, for you and the, and the governor's workforce cabinet, what's the motivation here? Uh, I, th I think, you know, uh, on the theme of the day and thinking about transitions, it really is figuring out not only transition from secondary to post-secondary or secondary uh, or post-secondary education, but also secondary into the workforce and post-secondary into the workforce or additional, uh, you know, on into graduate school opportunities. And those we really, I think, in thinking about the system holistically, need to do a better job of figuring out the, the handoffs, uh, making sure that they're easier for people, uh, whether it is uh, through engaging employers with work-based learning opportunities across the continuum. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that we really looked at at the onset of the development of the workforce cabinet was career coaching and navigation. Uh, how are we embedding work-based learning opportunities across the K-12 on into post-secondary and even our adult workforce? How are we creating opportunities for them? Um, and then also really strengthening CT. I think that's really the focus of uh, the workforce cabinet right now and making sure that there is real alignment between what is happening in K-12 and post-secondary 
And then we're hearing from the employers and really backward building that system. So we're creating opportunities for students when they graduate high school to be both enrollable and employable is what we keep saying coming out. So uh, we really need students to be both. And that first career opportunity is really just that. And how are we thinking about lifelong learning as a whole um, to recognize that, yes, if you are in an industry, recognize credential in high school. Um, so if we do include that as part of accountability, we are somehow incentivizing employers and individuals to think about, okay, this is just the first step along my career journey. I am going to have to go back as the economy changes to earn something else on down the road. Let me stick on this theme for a minute because I, I do want to, this idea that you need to continue to, to uh, kind of earn more credentials, stackable credentials, you need to kind of continue your education to be uh, competitive and successful in this economy. Um, how much of this is really well known and understood um, in in your state? Uh, if you just if you were in a local community and you're talking to the, you know, the, the parents, frankly, of, of of students who are in K-12, or if you're even talking to teachers or faculty in in colleges, um, I just want to get a sense of what how much work is needed to help people understand these new realities, even while we're trying to change the game and the policies and the practices. Or do you feel like people pretty much get that in Indiana because of the changes that they've seen in their local economies? Give me, give me, I don't, Teresa, what's your sense? I mean, how much work do we have to do to help people understand, or do they really kind of get it, and now we just have to help them get there? I, I often say that, you know, we are about changing a culture of a state, a state where people for very rational reasons did not need education beyond high school in order to have upward mobility in their lives. So that is a heavy lift, and I think while talking to people in, in this room, and let me just say how grateful we are to have our K-12 partners join us at this meeting today. Uh, we've done a pretty good job of in, engaging with employers and having the higher ed community at this, at this meeting every year, but we really need to have our K-12 partners at, with us working on this, so that's a great thing as well. So people in this room, I think, uh, understand, you know, what stackable credentials are, that 99% of the new jobs are gonna require some sort of education beyond high school. At a, at a personal level, families and individuals understand it to the extent that their opportunities are limited, or they lose a job, or, so it's a very personal kind of thing for them. I don't know that they could articulate um, in exactly the way we're talking about it today, but they feel it, they live it, and so I think when you have those discussions, if you can connect with them on that personal level of what Governor Holcomb tries to do, which is meet people where they are, wherever that might be, and taking them to the next level with opportunities. And I think that isn't just a slogan. I mean, it is a reality. Um, I think when you, you know, consider whether people understand those pathways, I think we may have to be much clearer about what happens to them if they don't have the opportunity to have a pathway. And it's why the information that you shared about the achievement gap is so important. It's why for first generation students, understanding how to navigate those systems is so important. So I think we have work to do. Um, I think we have leadership in place really committed to doing that. But we have a communications challenge of how do we get to parents? How do we get to students? How do we get to returning adults? And that's why working across these sectors is so important. Thank you. Either of you on that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think anecdotally, um, you know, we had a lot of information on this, or we thought we had a lot of information on this. Um, fortunately, the, the cabinet we uh, got stood up last May, uh, we worked with CICP on a grant to the Fairbanks Foundation, and one of the components of that grant opportunity was to determine and think about uh, research, the value that people placed on education and how it connected to a career. Um, and so that, that research was, was really finished up in late fall. And now we have a lot of good data to understand how uh, students, uh, you know, from high school into post-secondary, how parents, how employers, and how educators really feel about how education connects to a career. Uh, I think trying to, as Commissioner Lubbers pointed out, develop a communication strategy around that to really start to change the culture and mindset that, you know, ed education will take you further uh, along your career journey is just something that we have to continue to, to harp on. I want to add just something else. I, I think that... <laughs> 
you've been cut off. <laughs> um, I think we sort of in the past we've thought, you know, let's really invest in early childhood education. If we do that, we can check the box. We've got that done. Let's make sure we have the right standards for math and uh, English and literacy and science and all those things in the K-12, and we can check that off. Let's make sure people graduate from high school. Let's make sure people go to college. And it was as if at each of those marks, we were done. And you know, I think what we have really, that how we've changed the discussion is to now say, what we are really committed to is that people have the opportunity to have meaningful careers and lives. And all of those are markers along the way, but they're not discrete points of completion. And so I think to the degree that we are focused on successful careers and lives and how all of those fade into that and how we use data to actually get that information and share it is going to be the game changer. And I also think, you know, modeling for communities. I, I think we've somehow, uh, you know, K-12 has felt like they had to own this space and then post-secondary has to own this space, the employers own this space. I think one of the things that's, that's great about the individuals that we have leading our state agencies now is that there's this sense of collaboration unlike any that I have seen in my uh, five years in government. And, and I think if we can you know, get out there, talk to communities about how they partner together across that entire continuum, we'll start to see some of those silos break down like we're seeing at the state level. I think we're better positioned on this than we have been a long time. Um, we have a governor who's really rallied around this in a way that I don't know any governor before him has. I think, uh, I'm biased, but I think our commissioner has really been carrying this banner for a, a long time. Um, but I think despite all those efforts and in, in a, a level of unity that we've not had before, the, the message is still pretty mixed across the state. And I think even a word like college means a lot of different things to different people. And it's, I think we need to be honest about the fact that it's not always a positive message and I think sometimes we get hung up um, on the words and people start to think that that's not for them and our employers have to own part of this too because I think it's happening less and less but we still hear we don't really care about the credential we just want the skills well how do you get the skills without the credential and, and how can we make sure that the employer gets the skilled workers that he or she needs but the individual has a, a credential that offers some currency in the marketplace but I think there's still a lot of confusion around the state about what we mean by college and who that's for because for a number of years it was perfectly acceptable to say that kid's not college material. I think now though, it looked at the data that you presented that 99% of the jobs require something like college even if we're not so sure about that word all the time. We gotta redefine what we mean by college so that everyone sees a place for them in that space. That's a really important point and you're not alone in kind of fighting that communications battle. I think pretty much everywhere we are around the country for the most part, college, the first image is still a four-year degree and institution, even though community <laughs> colleges are thriving and there's a lot of effort to try to build quality community colleges. Um, do, one do you, thing I'd like to yeah. add on this, too, at the risk of taking over the panel, um, that uh, our employers need to take a closer look at what they're hiring for, too. When we look at our annual employer survey, we see the majority of employers, their, their minimum requirements are either a high school diploma or a four-year degree, but all the data shows that most of the skills are somewhere between that continuum. So my hypothesis is that we've been using those credentials more as screening mechanisms than we have as an actual direct reflection of what the job requires. And until we get clarity on that, I think it's hard to send a clear message to individuals about what kind of credential they need for a given industry and for a given job in an industry. Well put. I think employers need to step up and, and help with that process. And then there needs to be the transparency of that information provided, not only at the state level, but down at the community level in order to have these conversations be meaningful and get away from the wrong interpretation of the word college. But if you care about the career trajectory, you need better information from employers. Right now, there are limited data sets on that, right. I think we find around the country for really understanding labor market needs and what competencies and credentials open doors, as I was saying earlier, to certain jobs and careers. Um, so I think we're really looking for places that are going to change that game and come up with much more transparent information uh, that employers are leading that process right. um, and could be, you know, that in, your, in the chambers, in the next iteration, that could be a way to step up statewide and then help local chambers do, do the same thing. There's an effort in, um, in Washington, D.C. that just launched for the capital region. So there's a recognition, by the way, that 
the city of Washington um, is part of a larger economy that goes all the way from Baltimore to Richmond, for example. But the regional economy that was recognized, the bigger employers in that sort of said, um, we're hiring across the region, we're looking across the region. So there is an effort now to build um, what we're calling an employer signaling system, a new way to compile the data on the labor market needs, the jobs, the credentials, the opportunities, make that available region-wide so that all the school systems and higher ed institutions, whether they're in Northern Virginia, in Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., or in D.C., have access to that real-time information and can make decisions about their programs and their pathways based on a regional economic picture that is the way employers think. Um, I just believe that that kind of process needs to start playing itself out more so because it's very hard for schools or higher ed institutions to find this information on their own. And if we don't figure out a way to provide it, make it more real time available, it's going to be hard to do what we're, what we're all talking about. So that's just, I just wanted to flag that as a real reality based on, you know, the data challenges that exist. Let me go back, uh, Teresa, if you don't mind, to the, your reminder, we've got K-12 leaders in this audience, we have higher ed leaders in this audience. And you took the time with your colleagues last year to, to, to kind of look in the mirror on this question of transitions from high school to college and what we could do to make it better. Um, talk a little bit about what inspired you to put that uh, steering committee together, do that work, and what do you see as some of the kind of most important moves that can be made as a result uh, now that you have both boards that signed off on this? Well, you shared a lot of the information of, of what we talked about and what the state board and the Commission for Higher Education supported. Um, we have, understandably, and I think rightfully so, spent a lot of time at the commission in the last five to six years looking at issues related to returning adults. How do we make sure that there are opportunities for people to come back and skill up? But, you know, we cannot <laughs> lose sight of the pipeline of people who are going from high school into the next chapter of their lives. And, and we wanted to be very intentional as, about that as well. You know, juxtapose that against this 60% goal, we're at 43.4%, you know, we have to do both. You know, unfortunately, in the policy arena, and maybe this is true about life generally, we tend to make false choices. You know, we choose, is it people are going to get trained or people are going to get educated? Is it people are going to get a four-year degree or they're going to get a two-year degree? And we pit those things against each other as if they were, um, you know, not intended to have the same goal. It really is about right fit for the individual based on their aspirations and their preparation and the needs of the economy based on what we know will be the, the current and growing needs of the workforce and then how we're really changing a culture of a state. This transition from high school to college is the place where we are most likely to be leaving people behind early. So whether, it's why we talk so much about the 21st Century Scholars Program, because we know that for the scholars, they have the opportunity to break all of the kinds of barriers that might be there. And so when we looked at this, and you know, my, reflecting upon you know, the, the years that I was in the State Senate and I chaired the Education Committee, I, I can't even remember a time during those years where we really had K-12 and higher education really talking. Uh, and now, they, they weren't <laughs> adversarial. It's just that there was no intentionality about talking about what they do and smoothing this transition. I think that actually um, we were, were getting better at, at that, and I think it is less siloed, but it's still not going to happen without the kind of things what are the practices and policies that require us to work together? So how do we do these navigational supports? How do we talk about careers earlier? And how do we align them with what people learn? You know, when we started doing the college readiness report, and thank you to, to K-12 partners, because principals and superintendents were asking for that report. They wanted to look at how their students were doing when they were leaving high school. Did they need remediation, what they were studying? But oh, guess what? We had to look at college completion as well. When we got those students, were we, gr were we graduating them? And if, were they persisting? And what, what happened when they got there? And those are not um, disaggregated goals as if they were different populations. Those are aligned goals. So um, it seemed a slam dunk to me that we would find ways to actually bring K-12 and higher education together and figure out how we could do this better. And, and thanks to, to your good work, Matt, and others, um, 
and those of you who were a part of any of those meetings, these were, no, these were very, um, these were colleagues working together with shared goals and you know you have to work through some things but it was it was not a tough sell to say we need to do this better and um, you know implementing a transition math course is not going to be easy but we all kn we all know that there were people who were finishing uh, their their algebra 2 course and they weren't really ready for college so how could we combat that well you've got to do it by working together and that's just one example of a how this group, I think, is committed to changing the landscape going forward. If I could, I'd like to add to that list of false choices, this notion that we have to make a decision for students between a strong academic foundation and relevant technical <laughs> skills. I think for a long time, and I think it's still more so the case than we would like, we've kind of put students on one or the other of those two paths, and I think all the data shows that if we equip students with all of one column and nothing of the second column, they're gonna be at a disadvantage, but I think there needs to be a closer integration of the education so that we aren't inadvertently sending students down a purely academic path or a purely technical path, because I think both have something to gain from you know, uh, uh, the complementary experience of those two coming together. Well, the people who will be most employable are the ones who actually combine those two things, right. who actually have a good combination of the academic and applied. But, but we hear it all the time, and I, you know, I hate I hate uh, using anecdotes, but I spend a lot of time in the state house right now, and that's everything driven on anecdotes. Um, and you know, we hear about ah, they don't need the, they don't need those academic skills because they're going into the workforce. But then we hear from you know our employers that they need the full range of critical thinking and and um, problem solving skills that often come with strong backing and liberal arts. Um, and then we hear it going the other direction too. So I think that's another one of those sort of false narratives that just confuses people and inadvertently leads them to make counterproductive decisions. Um, I'm really glad you raised that. We're seeing much more enthusiasm and energy around, for example, CTE in K-12 right now than we've seen in decades across the country. <coughs> and the best work we've seen are the places that are building high quality CTE programs that include dual enrollment opportunities and embed post-secondary opportunities right into the pathways rather than saying it's an either or choice. Um, by far, those are the highest performing systems um, in the country to the point where people are beating down the doors to get into those programs, which is kind of what we want. Um, and this, the national organization that represents uh, CTE um, directors uh, around the country did a survey to find out what are, the, what are they hearing and what do they think is valuable. And even around messaging and communicating, like we were talking about earlier, their main uh, headline coming out of that survey and that work was we have to talk about CTE as a post-secondary readiness path, not as an alternative, and that that is what parents want to hear. So talk about the customer and the parent and the student. They are much more drawn to a CTE program or pathway if they see it as a pathway into college rather than a pathway around or to avoid college. So just know there is data backing up these actions if you decide to take them. And I know you're already working in that direction here, right, for the governor's cabinet and strategy. I'd love to give you a minute to talk about what, what you're doing there and, it, and on the even on the graduation pathways, how you're trying to kind of bring together rather than tear apart college and career readiness. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, I mean, there is a real stigma around CTE. And I, and I think, to your point, Matt, the only way to get around that is for parents and students to see that as a pathway into post-secondary. Um, so, you know, one of the, the things that we've really been working on, and it's, it's been a, a collaboration again, like so much of the work that we've been doing with, we have, uh, you know, Jason in the chamber at the table, uh, the commission, our friends at DWD and DOE, Ivy Tech and Vincennes, and really looking at, uh, and I think Perk the reauthorization of Perkins has kind of given us a little bit of an opportunity to take a step back and look at what we're doing, especially when looking at the alignment of the coursework and making sure that we're not duplicating efforts in K-12 and also at the introductory level in our post-secondary institutions. So you mentioned the Tennessee Promise earlier. Uh, you know, we have a similar effort with the Workforce Ready Grant program here in Indiana. And so we started with that list of technical certificates in our high demand, high wage sectors that are part of that and at Ivy Tech and Vincennes. And we're looking at the coursework that's required there and trying to back that down into the high school setting. 
so that as we're redesigning CTE under Perkins, our students that would go through two courses at the high school level have an opportunity to earn that first year of college before they even graduate. So with all of the industry credentials or recognized certifications that are embedded within those um, courses as well, so we're working on that right now. Uh, we're actually just getting ready, I think, next week to, to look at doing that with cybersecurity as the next pathway that we embark upon, um, but really creating that opportunity for a true post-secondary attainment option uh, for our CTE students, not just on the technical side, as Jason pointed out, but when you look at the coursework that's required for that first year technical certification, uh, completion, it also is embedded with, uh, you know, math and English skills, uh, communication skills um, that are necessary for that one-year completion at the post-secondary level as well. And I, I think it's important to also mention that those students who, both in high school and certainly in college, this focus on making sure that they have a quality internship or some exposure to the world of work while they're in school. So we've been very focused on uh, work-based experiences in college, you know, no, no one should graduate from college and show up for a job and be surprised. Uh, they should know what that job is like, and it, they should have been preparing for that, you know, in a very intentional way throughout. So, um, you know, we, we certainly work with the chamber. Um, you know, we work with our program called Earn Indiana, which is our work-study program, which is a really very um, comprehensive way to do an internship program. So I think, you know, I often say that we believe that you know uh, involvement with work should be an expectation and not an exception for people. And I think this is true for CTE, and it's true for those who are in the higher education arena as well. And, well put. And Matt, on the on the graduation pathway, so I, I was the governor's education policy director when we really pushed for uh, graduation pathways at the, the secondary level. Um, you know, I, I taught high school math for about ten years. I ended up teaching my last two years a uh, really preparing for the uh, I-STEP 10 exam course that was really just, you know, regurgitated Algebra 1 content uh, to help prep for that test. Uh, I saw students that were, uh, you know, able to get a, a B in pre-calculus, but they hadn't passed that statewide exam yet, so they were co-enrolled in the course that I was teaching and pre-calculus. Uh, Algebra 1 student had an A. And so really thinking through, should we really require a single test for high school graduation? Or should we open that up to where students can demonstrate that they are earning something that's tangible uh, that would apply to post-secondary before they even graduate? Um, I, I think the, the intent there was really to align what the students are earning in that post-secondary readiness competency with what they want to do. I, I hope schools you know, implement that with fidelity and not just look at that list of opportunities and say, well, you know, I'm going to get a, a, a student to take the ASVAB and pass that 31 because they're going to be eligible for graduation. That was not the intent of Grad Pathways. It was if a, if a student wants to go to the military, which is, which is a great career, then the ASVAB is available for them. But if they wanted to go on into post-secondary looking at the dual credit route, or the, the uh, ACT or SAT route, some of those things. So let's make sure that we are building pathways with intentionality for students that really align to their post-secondary goals. You know, you mentioned the, the grad plan earlier as one of the components for our 21st century scholars to complete. I think one of the recommendations that came out of the cabinet this fall was that we really uh, enhance that graduation plan. I think what a lot of uh, students do now is they look at their graduation requirements and just fill those out without thinking through how those graduation requirements build into what they want to do after high school. So we have to make sure that students are thinking at an earlier age, as Jason mentioned, how their coursework would align to their goals that they want to want to achieve on down the road. Yeah, how do we make it more about planning for your next step, not just getting out of the, the, the high school successfully? Yeah. That's well put. Yeah, no, we want to have some, a few minutes to get the audience involved, so I want to encourage anyone who wants to ask a question to uh, raise your hand. We'll have some mics coming around the room, and we'll try to get uh, you all involved in this uh, conversation. Yeah, they're in the back. Hi there. Good morning. Uh, a question for you all in terms of dual credit and teacher credentialing. Uh, we have a huge problem in terms of continuing on with our robust dual credit offerings in this state, but we do not have in place uh, enough incentives and strategies to help get those teachers credentialed. Yes, we have the STEM teacher recruitment fund, but it's 
making this big a dent. We need to work on the pipeline of upcoming teachers as well as those that are in the classroom. But what ideas do you have for next steps for Indiana in that realm? I can't say with certainty, but we are certainly working um, with the legislature even now to try to identify some additional funding for the preparation for dual credit teachers. As many of you in the room know, we received the extensions that we have until 2022 to make sure that our teachers meet the credentials that they need. Uh, but that is quickly coming, isn't it? So, um, you know, my most recent recommendation, and I'm, 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 you know, speaking without any certainty that any of this will happen, but is that we would maintain the STEM teacher recruitment fund and we would use for STEM teachers that <coughs> fund, but that we would have an additional fund separate for priority dual credit that is not uh, that it's not a STEM teacher preparation that would give us two sources of funding to do that. As you know, um, CTE dual credit is, n is not a part of that requirement, so we don't have to be concerned about that. We need to be concerned about, you know, what we have as dual credit liberal arts uh, uh, courses. So I don't know, Janet, whether that will happen or not, but that is, we're certainly working behind the scenes to try to do that. Um, Ken Sowers in the back of the room, and I know you work with Kevin, our chief academic officer, and you know we're we're doing we're making progress, but you know we're going to have to do more in order to meet that goal. You know the good news story, which one, we want to continue, is the one that you know Matt you highlighted, which is that our new report shows that 64 percent of students graduate from high school with some sort of college credit, and I think we are probably leading the country in that regard. So there is a huge commitment to do that. We know that those students who take dual credit are more likely to attend and persist and complete college as well, and so um, we have to make sure we have the teachers who are qualified to do that. So I don't have an answer with certainty, but we certainly have a commitment. Well, if I could add two things to that. One, I, I think it's going to be a struggle to address this issue in a significant way unless we're willing to re-examine teacher pay. There's a lot of conversations about teacher pay right now, but just raising it generally. But um, th there's going to have to be a new willingness to differentiate teacher pay based upon um, need. Um, and I think the other thing that comes along with that is I think it's unrealistic to expect significant numbers of people to leave high paying jobs from say an Eli Lilly to come teach high school chemistry or physics, but perhaps if there was more flexibility to let people from industry sort of serve in an adjunct capacity at the secondary level, we might be able to increase our capacity to deliver this type of coursework. Yeah, and I also think, Janet, I mean, not only looking at how are we upskilling our current K-12 teachers, but how are we increasing the number of dual enrollment opportunities that we have uh, instead of dual credit, how are we looking at dual enrollment, professor on loan programs that I know Ivy Tech has and others. So I, I, it's going to have to be a community-wide approach and something that K-12 doesn't solve on its own. It's going to take higher ed partnering with them to offer other opportunities as well. Especially if the goal is not just offering a bunch of CTE courses or dual credit courses generally, but actually a sequence of courses that leads to a credential. We're just going to have to get a lot deeper on this. Right with the eye toward which credentials have the most value. Yeah. But just to reiterate, you guys are leading the country in, in uh, participation right now, dual, dual credit and APIB advanced courses. So we want to see you continue to lead the country. There's a lot of folks working hard to try to up their game on this right now. And they're facing the same issues you're talking about, about the pay and access, getting access to, you know, to folks who have uh, STEM or other industry experience. So, uh, but we know Indiana's going to keep leading, so we're really looking forward to shining the spotlight. Other questions up here? Yeah, and introduce yourself if you don't mind for the audience. Hi, my name is Leslie. So I personally am a fourth generation college graduate and my son will be a fifth college generation graduate. So I don't really have concerns about my generation, um, but my concern is about my son's generation and even millennials. So we know that research shows that black students with bachelor degrees are equivalent to white students with a high school diploma. So they are already behind. A black student with a master's degree is equivalent to a white student with a bachelor's degree. What are you doing to address these achievement gaps so that the playing field is equal? We need to know that when black students are attending college 
and attaining these college degrees, especially a bachelor's degree, they are already behind in a acquiring certain jobs. May when I they, ask you a question? With their master's degree, they're behind. Are you talking in terms of the pay that they would get with the bachelor's, or is it, is it an, or, or what exactly are you talking in terms of equivalency? Pay, the, the type of job that they'll get. So we need to, so research shows that a black student applying for a job, if he, if he or she has a bachelor's degree, they're being considered for jobs that a white student with a high school diploma, it's equivalent. So we're already behind. So I know, for example, my son will have to get his master's degree. My husband has a master's degree. I have three masters. So we know that that is, that, that, that it's, a, it's a must, it's a guarantee. You have got to get more than just your bachelor's degree. You got to. So what are you doing to make sure that not only are minorities going to get their bachelor's degree, but they've got to get even more because they're always going to be behind others. Well, that's a tough one. Um, and it, I mean, it's a, I mean, I, I understand the reasons behind the question. And I think it's why we have been so focused on, this is not an adequate answer to your question, but I will tell you some of the things that we are trying to do that would begin to address that. So the, you know, the fact that we, we recognize that we need to close the achievement gap and we, the members of the commission several years ago established this goal of closing the achievement gap by 2025. Now that could be interpreted in lots of ways, much like your question, are we closing the achievement gap in terms of college going, in terms of college completion, in terms of what, what kind of benefits people get from their college degree once they leave. I think all of those are a part. But one of the, I always say that the commission, you know, does, we do those things that no one institution could do on their own. And one of those things would be the reports that we put out in the use of data. So thanks to Sean and others on his team in the commission, we put out an equity report this last year, which I think was probably as deep a dive on some of these issues that we've seen. It's not an answer, but you can't get an answer until you know the numbers that you're actually talking about. One of the things that we might want to consider, which I don't think was a part of that report, and which could speak to your question a little bit, is how are, if we disaggregate all of our reports by race and ethnicity, how are our college graduates doing by race and ethnicity one, five, and 10 years out in certain occupations? And begin to inform the work that we're doing. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we want to believe that everybody has an opportunity to both access higher education and use the benefits of higher education in a way that you know, they're not limited and that they have upward mobility. So I would say our commitment to closing the gap, our commitment to our equity report, our commitment to really following students, not just when they graduate from college, but how they do in life and disaggregating that by race and ethnicity is a really important step. Anyone else on this topic? Tough topic, but I'm glad, I really appreciate the question because sometimes we don't get these things out in the open and we don't address them. So, and I, I think it's a great, places that are starting by trans, full transparency of data as, and as Teresa says, beyond just the degree, um, big piece of this is who's getting these credentials, but then what are they doing when they get into the workforce, to your point, and are they getting hired? What's their pay level? How do you compare that? Uh, that would be a great start. And I'm glad you asked. Thank you for the question. Others? Yes. It Deborah Curtis, Indiana State University. I have a question about how we as a state help students, and I'm talking about K through 20 and beyond, navigate the systems. And I think it's relevant to your reference to the handoff of the baton, because I think that's our biggest challenge. And I, I've often been curious about how do we provide that, that stream of support to students? I mean, go back to the FAFSA, filling that out. How do we have navigators in place? Perhaps they're on college four-year and two-year campuses and they work in a statewide connection. The, the high school counselors are doing all that they can, but I'm not too sure that they have access to the information they need on a regular basis to help students navigate first gen here as well, and I'm thrilled to see a panel finally in our lifetime full of first generation college graduates because we understand where that comes from. So I'm wondering, how do we get that navigator role in place for everybody 
whether it's undergrad, masters, or whatever credentialing they need to move forward? Really important question. This was a, this was a big topic on the steering committee this last year, as, as, I, as I recall. There's, first of all, it's a chat. I'm just going to give you my national perspective. In both K-12 and higher ed, this is a major, just the counseling and the supports, major challenges in, in both. Uh, but what's fascinating is there's very few places that are coming at the solution by doing it together. So you tend to see a lot of effort in the higher ed sector to, to work on, on it there. And then you see, you know, a whole challenge in K-12 and high schools around counselors, right, who are too few of them for the number of students. And to be honest, they at best know about the college advising part. They don't know much about the career advising part. And they admit that. Um, so how could you come at this together and build a, a, a kind of an aligned strategy? I just want to not highlight one place we saw, and it's in the report that I referenced here, uh, Miami-Dade uh, Community College um, has a, ver a program called Shark Path that they developed that's exactly getting at what you're uh, describing, which is they decided the best way to help with this problem was to put their counselors from Miami-Dade into the high schools and work with the high school students from the early stage of their high school career, especially the first gen students, uh, and have mentors and counselors who are just like those students come in and help guide them through the process. And it's been game changing for them in terms of the data and helping those students. And it was just a relatively simple idea. Don't wait till they arrive here and have your staff working with them here. Actually show up there and work with them in the high schools to get them ready. And I think it's ideas like that that aren't that um, complicated, but can be transformational if we figure out systemically how to do it. That's just my perspective <coughs> looking around the country, but it's a big challenge for sure. So I'd love to get your guys' take. I'm a big believer in structure in, in these types of conversations. And I think the more at risk the population, the tighter and more comprehensive that structure needs to be. Unfortunately, I think we have a tendency to do the opposite. Um, students who are in you know, high academic programs have very clear structure every step of the way, whereas more at-risk students often are more likely to fall through the cracks. I think to give Indiana some credit, we've done a lot with the 21st Century Scholars Program to really lay out that blueprint for, the, for students, but there's nothing on that list that isn't just as relevant for students writ large. But I think um, because we have such an aversion to tracking, because we have such an aversion to kind of across the board requirements, sometimes that path isn't as clear as it could be for students. I would like to really just call out and thank uh, you, uh, President Curtis, and what Indiana State has committed to the 21st Century Scholars Program and to first generation students. But I'd also like to offer a really practical way that we could leave today and be committed to doing something in this regard. And that is just, it's one thing, but in this, this whole discussion of summer melt that was raised. If there was ever an area that, that K-12 and higher ed need to look at that transition. So if we have, and I don't know what Indiana's numbers are nationally, you said one in five who actually could be you know, has the aspiration, has gone so far as to be accepted, and they don't show up. You know, what is happening during that time, and how could an organ a group like this and our transitions committee work to make sure that that doesn't happen? It starts with finding out why it's happening, where it's happening, and so, you know, in a practical way, let's address summer melt and see what we can do. Well, one, one of the things, and, and Chris Lowry from Ivy Tech can chaired uh, this effort on the workforce cabinet's behalf, uh, spending six months from May through really the November looking at career navigation across the entire system. Um, we see some communities doing it really well where, again, it's a collaborative effort from K-12 higher ed businesses all coming together. Um, right now in legislation, we have a line item for career navigation coaching. Uh, to be administered through the cabinet. We have been working with a team across K-12, uh, higher ed and workforce. Jason's been a part of that, and so is the commission, DOE, um, and designing parameters for that grant program. Um, we're hopefully uh, next week at the cabinet meeting going to approve what those parameters look like so we can, as soon as the legislation passes and we know there's going to be money available, um, get that out there. The, the, the intention of the grant was not to fund staff, but really to bring those entities together to think through, okay, you have a career coach here, you have a career coach here, how can we align our efforts and really take someone through that entire system? Um, so that is something that you'll be seeing coming out of the cabinet here shortly. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions over here on the left. 
get a mic over there. Thanks. So kudos to so many things that you guys are doing in programs across the state, and particularly with the 21st Century Scholars Program, because I really think that's wonderful. I do see a huge gap for the students who were falling into this lady's comments here a minute ago, and for the students who really don't have what you were talking about a second ago, and that's a uh, clear idea of what a career path is. And the ones that I see as a president of Shortridge High School's Alumni Association here in the city are those students who have never left their neighborhoods. A couple of years ago, I took students to the state fair, which is less than a mile and a half from Shortridge High School. They had never had a lemon shakeup. They'd never seen an elephant ear. They'd never been on the state fair property at 18 years old. And to me, that just says that they have no idea what college is. My favorite line is, you don't know what you don't know. And unless we can give them an opportunity to spend a couple of days and see what it is that is college or career or training or something that is not like their high school continued, then they have no bar because their parents have no bar and oftentimes their parents haven't had a bar. And the lack of parenting that says, you ought to look at this, you ought to try this, you ought to consider this, and then you couple that with the lack of counseling, guidance that's taking place in local high schools for those students who aren't on a career path, that's not gonna help your situation. Now, I love some of the programs that the nonprofits have started, like uh, Starfish here in town and a couple of others that are mentoring Arnie Duncan said at one point in time, you want to help education, volunteer. You know what it's like for a white male to walk into a high school and say you want to volunteer in this day and age? There are red flags that go up all over the place. You just can't work with an organization unless you're under a nonprofit organization that's working there regularly. Parents can't get in to pick up their kids, let alone volunteer with a teacher unless they're 100% supervised. And to me, that's appropriate for our day and age, but I'm not sure that it's helping the cause. Well, let, let, let me uh, respond to uh, a part of what you're saying, which is, you know, when we look at, one, one of my concerns about how we do this navigation work, which I think is so important, and we have to make sure that students have a better understanding, but depending on the tools that we use, we tend to ask students, we, we tend to do interest surveys when we look at what students are going to do and what you're interested in doing. And often we um, exclude, and, and the, what that tends to be then is, as you have indicated, they are interested in often what they know. And so, and, and not a full range of what might be the option. And you know, the difference between someone telling a student, did you know you're good at this? Something that they never thought what this might be. So we need to make sure that as we do this navigation, we are aligning interest with employer needs, with aptitudes, all of those things playing into it so that we don't have, again, we talk about under matching or kind of matching with college. You know, we're taking on sort of a godlike role here when we do navigation. We're telling people, you know, do this. Well, we better have a full picture of what that actually means as we do it, because there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. Um, I think we're committed to doing it in a full, comprehensive way, which again, matches interest, with aptitude, with needs, all of those things have to be considered. Yeah, I, I would go add one thing to Teresa on what we need to be looking at in, in our career navigation system, and that is self-efficacy. Do our students really know how to connect the dots from one step to the next? And if they don't, then how are we leading them there? Because some students are gonna be just fine. They're gonna be able to apply for the FAFSA on their, on their own but others are not. And so how are we lifting up those students that are not, so. So I know we're, we're running out of time. I'm gonna get, I wanna have one final word from each of you with a particular uh, uh, angle I'd like you to take, which is we spent a lot of time here talking about state. I talked about states. I spend my time going around the country looking at states and state policy. But I also know that the real action, the real work is happening in institutions and in communities. Um, so I'd love for each of you just to say uh, a little bit about, as we close out here, how you can go from having a state commission and, and state board adoptions and resolutions and state 
chamber policies and governor's kind of cabinet strategies to local action? Like, what advice do you have for folks in this room for what they can do to kind of drive and own this work in their local communities and take advantage of the opportunities the state has created, but make this kind of a locally owned agenda in Indiana? Yeah, I guess I would say the flip side to some of the data that Chris Lamo shared at the beginning about how uh, the, the skills gap and a lack of qualified talent is a serious problem across the state. But the flip side of that is, if I think employers are willing to try things that they've not had to try in the past. And I think there's a newfound willingness to um, engage in a deeper and a more sustained way with education than they have in the past. But I think how you all, as the experts in the education arena can help, is approaching employers in your community with that goal in mind, not this, you know, sort of, I need you to be on this advisory group, or I need you to, you know, take this, place these number of interns. It's, you know, how can we actually think through what a talent strategy, a pipeline strategy could be that benefits you as the employer, but we know is gonna benefit our students. And I think those conversations are starting to happen, but I don't think they're happening um, across the board the way we would like to see. And, if, and if, if you have the opportunities to have those those kinds of conversations with industry in your area, I would really encourage you to do so. Thank you. I'd say, I'd say have a willingness to not own all of the work. <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of times, you know, K-12, K post second, they feel like they have to own it. I, invite the employers in. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the, the components of 1002 that's going through right now is to allow employers to actually teach some CTE courses. Uh, so, you know, ha have open your doors, let people in. It is a community-wide effort. Unless we're collaborating, we're not going to solve this on our own. Thank you. Well, I certainly agree with both of those. And as an old-time marketing person, I really think we need a compelling, personalized campaign. I remember years ago when we had the A-plus program and we wanted to add five days to the school year. and. You know, we basically went out and sold to employers and schools and parents why this was gonna be important. It was gonna be a financial investment, but why we needed to do it. We need to have a campaign that reaches people where they are, that is compelling, because we're asking for behavioral changes. And people are gonna to have to make behavioral changes. They have to know that there's a payoff for doing that. And then I would, we're gonna hear from the governor later on, and just as, you know, I'm, I'm so encouraged because if you look at states where we've really been able to drive policy, it, the governor's leadership of a state really matters. All of us can do what we can do in our corners of the world, but a governor who's committed to making this workforce infrastructure issue the most important issue helps all of us, and then we have to personalize this in a, a compelling campaign. Thank you. Well put. Um, I, I want to note that uh, we're wrapping up this plenary session and going in, I think, to three um, breakout sessions that are listed on your agenda that are very relevant to what we were just talking about so you can get involved in the conversation. Uh, I want to thank uh, my panelists, my fellow panelists, PJ, Jason, and Teresa. Thank you. And thank all of you for uh, uh, being so attentive and engaging this morning. Uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting, and thanks for uh, allowing me to come and be here with you today. All right.